Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I like it. Everybody's awake. Man, I'm excited. You know, I want to I kind of roll off the back of communion here. This series, I, I, me and my family, we've only been here for eight, nine weeks. And we've been in this series the whole time. And even the eight or nine weeks that we've been here, God has moved in huge ways. I mean, and I'm just reminded at what God is doing here. And I want it to never be missed by our congregation. That we never forget that God is doing a work that not every church gets to see all the time. I mean, if you haven't got a chance, swing by the board where you see the latest, you know, 310 salvations over the last two and a half years. I mean, come on. That's something we need to say. That you churches just don't see that anymore. Come on. The baptisms, the Bibles, the, you know, it's our church coming together. It's God doing a work. It is Christ moving in us. It is the Spirit coming alive within us. And we are called to commit to God. And so this morning, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible this morning, we would love to gift you one. We, we, we believe, uh, we've got people coming down the road. If you'll just hold your hand up, we'll gift you one. We, we believe that every person needs, needs a scripture, and we want to gift it to you. It's yours to keep. So anyway, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6. We're going to be wrapping up this series, and this morning, I don't want you to think of it as a point-by-point sermon. I want you to think of it as us talk. We're just talking through it. We're going to go verse by verse. We're We're going to conversate through it. We're going to wrap up about what we have talked about and called to commit, about what God has taught us and about how Paul has led us from the idea of these people who are captive by the teachings of legalism and of the world and are now free in the spirit and how Christ through the cross sets us free. And as Cash read earlier, we are now children of God grafted into the family of God because of the cross of Jesus, because of the price he paid. We can now be called children of God. As John 1 reads, we, are, we now have the right to be called sons and daughters. Somewhere out there, there is a new birth certificate. And I don't, know, I, I don't know if you had a mom or dad growing up or if you grew up in the perfect house. Or, I don't know. But somewhere out there, if you've accepted Jesus, there is a new birth certificate that says adopted by the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The day you were saved, stamped by the Trinity. That means you are a child of God. That means you can be free from your fear and free from those things. We're going to start out in verse 11. And it took me a little bit to get a handle on this verse. And being somebody that, you know, I've got dyslexia. I've always struggled with reading. And I always thought that Paul here was just kind of, you know, here's what he writes. Notice I write in large letters. I use as I write these closing words in my own handwriting and my knee-jerk reaction was to think man he is just saying listen to me these are my words this is what you should do but if you dig deeper into it he is talking about his credibility He is talking about the words that have said the true gospel, what is being taught. Because people were going around and they were saying all these different things. Y'all remember this in high school, right? Somebody started a small rumor about you. Anybody ever been there? Don't lie, you've been there. (laughs) Let's just say somebody said, Cody asked for a piece of gum and I didn't have it. Whatever. Four days later, you come to school and Cody's done stole a gorilla from the zoo and he's trained it to drive around a truck on a tricycle. (laughs) That's just how gossip, gossip works. And so Paul is talking to the Galatian people and he's saying, listen, 
These people are saying, Paul is saying this and Paul is saying that. And he's saying, listen, you need to consider the source. You need to consider the source of what is being taught. You need to consider the source of being, what is being said. You need to consider the source of what is being preached. And that goes for us today. How many of us, instead of considering the source, we take social media as gospel? We take it and run with it. You know, that's like, you know, 90% of the things on the internet are not true. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> right? <laughs> Paul is saying, listen, I did not say these things. He's saying, I did not say you had to go through circumcision again. I didn't say you had to go through this. I didn't say you had to go through these rituals. I said, live free in the spirit. He goes, listen, I'm writing you this letter to say, live free in the spirit. This this is in my own handwriting. This is, listen, big bulky letters, caps, all caps. Hashtag, it's me, Paul. You know, nobody probably thought about this when you, when you hear my name, but I, every once in a while I get a little bit of hate email. And you're thinking, Cody, why do you get hate email? Well, because I used to be an evangelist, and when I would travel as a communicator, um, I had CodyBrown.net as my website. And I would get, how dare you support polygamy and have multiple wives? Some of you are laughing because you get it. And the other ones that don't, I'm about to make it very clear. There's a show on TLC called Sister Wives. The guy's name who has five wives is Cody Brown. (laughs) So there's these, you know, just saying there was like, I mean, I had to tie back to some of these people and be like, listen, you need to read my website. You know, I'm from Arkansas, not Salt Lake City. You know what? I'm just saying, we, we, we take gossip too many times as the gospel. We have got to start going to the source. And this is our source, the scripture, the word of God, what you have in your hands this morning, what we are teaching, what we are preaching. What is it saying? They didn't have Twitter handles back then, but I mean, instead of like, you know, you've seen them now, like, you know, the real Cody Brown, that ain't my Twitter, so if you tag somebody, that ain't me. Um, But, you know, he's saying, like, this is the real Paul writing here. This is the real teachings. And what I'm saying is I love you regardless of what the culture says and all the things that they're trying to place on you and that I'm for you no matter what they try to place on you and they're trying to put these laws on you and this legalism on you and they're trying to tell you you got to do this, this, and this and this checklist to be saved. He's saying, I'm here to tell you that it's Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Nothing we can bring to this equation makes us any more saved than the grace that Jesus puts on us. So we move to verse 12, and 12 reads, Those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good for others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching the cross of Christ alone can save. These people who are trying to force them into it, to this huge commitment, are not... uh, they're doing it for their own good. Their motivation is negative. And can I just, can I tell you this morning that as long as you're trying to please man, you will never fully be pleasing God. Let me say that again. As long as you are trying to please man, you will never be able to fully please God. Because when we try to gratify our flesh, And our humanly desires, we put that above God. And anything, as I said last week, anything we put above God is what? An idol. And idols have to be torn down. Verse 13. And even those who abdicate for circumcision don't even keep the whole law themselves. 
They want you to only uh, be circumcised to keep, um, so they can boast and claim you as their disciples. First of all, I know you ain't asking me to make that big of a commitment. And let's just agree, that is a big commitment for a grown man to make. We laugh, but they're dead serious, right? That's a huge commitment for a grown man to make. And then Paul is like, listen, these people who are trying to force that on you, they may have you convinced, but in reality, there are laws that they're not keeping themselves. So if they want to push that law on you, then why aren't they keeping it? And he goes, that's, there's a problem there. There's a motivation issue. There's an issue here. And and it comes down to uh, almost a, they're superimposing on people, right? Man, I hate it when people order pizza for me. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, put some dead fish on there. I want anchovy. I really, that's what I wanted. Please put some mushrooms on that pizza. <laughs> Man. Look, if it grows in my yard, I don't want to eat it. You can keep your lettuce, your pepperoni, cheese. There you go. (laughs) But we have have bought into this idea that we can have an a la carte salvation. We bought into this idea that we can pick and choose what we want and set aside what we don't. We've decided that we can take this commercialized retail Christianity and set aside the hard things. We've decided that the things we're for, we'll go to battle over those, but the sins in our life, we don't want to confront them. It is the story going back to the teachings of Jesus How can you get the splinter out of your brother's eye while you have a log in your own? I mean, so many Christians, we we want to pick, we want to choose. But what does it look like? What does our faith look like to the outside world? What are you going to buy into? And what does that look, I mean, do we try to make it look good for us or are we trying to further the kingdom? Because that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Are we trying to better ourselves? Are we trying to make ourselves look better? Is it all based in our pride or is it trying to further the kingdom? Because ultimately what Paul is saying here is, listen, these people are in it for their own good. I am writing to you out of a heart for the gospel, which is jumping ahead a couple of verses. But he is saying, listen, you, are, you can't listen to these people. They don't have your best interest at heart. They have their best interest at heart. And every time that you feel like somebody doesn't have your best interest at heart, I'm telling you, you want to know where to go? You get in the Word of God. The Word of God is, we believe that the Word of God is then, it is the perfect Word. We take our teachings, we take our lessons, we take our knowledge, we take everything we know about our beliefs from this book. Verse 14 says this, as for me, so Paul says this, Paul is changing to him now. As for me, may I never boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in the world has been crucified and the interest in, my interest in the world has also died. There are certain things that Southern preachers use that I've always laughed at, but that I always remember. And here Paul is talking about when he met Jesus, his interest changed. He says, I literally put my interest to death on a cross. I literally put my interest, my wants, my things on that cross with Jesus, and I took up his interest, his wants, his needs, and I went for him. And I've heard Southern preachers say this. Meeting Jesus is like meeting an 18-wheeler or a tidal wave. 
You won't meet him without being changed. And I always used to laugh at that and think, man, you're crazy. But how true is that? That that when we have an encounter with the Savior, the God of the universe, the one who created us from the dust of the earth, who formed us, knitted us together in our mother's womb, he would go to a cross and die for us. He would shed blood for us. Think about the meaning to Paul. The cross that, that he at first persecuted, helped hunt down and murder people against the cross. He has an encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road and such an amazing transformation later, he's now writing these scriptures to us and saying you can live in the freedom of the Spirit. Even Paul with all his problems, even Peter with all his problems, they were set free and able to live. Think of the cross To Jesus, how much he cared about you to go through it. We remembered that this morning in communion. But how often do you think about that? Do you remember the nails that pierced his hands? Do you remember the whip that pierced his back, that tore flesh from bone? Do you remember that all that blood that was shed on that day was for you and for me? Because Paul says... I'm not going to boast anything else. And believe me, if you go and you read some other chapters, whether it be in Corinthians or some other places, Paul has a very long list of things he can brag about. But Paul says here, I don't have anything to boast about anymore. All I can boast about is Christ crucified on that cross and how he rose up from the grave and put death in it. What do you boast about? What does your life say about you? What does your action say about you? What are you doing? Verses 15 and 16. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon us and all those who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. Say that with me. They are are the new new people people of God. We are called to be the new people of God. Do you see what he's saying to these Judaizers right now? These people who are pushing the old covenant, who are pushing the, the Jewish ways on them. He's saying, listen, that not only is that not the right way, he's saying, listen, the new people of God are those who believe in the Son. And I don't know about you, if you're not Jewish in here this morning, you need to celebrate the fact that Jesus didn't just come to save the Jews, but he also came for the Gentiles. Because if you're not a Jew, therefore you are a Gentile. And so I'm glad that Jesus was willing to come for me. What matters most? We see Paul talking here about a transformation. He talks about the new person. And the book of Galatians is all about transforming. It's about being called to commit. And you know, that's what our sermon series is. It's about going from the old to the new. It's about going from legalism to grace. It's about going from living in bondage to living in the freedom of the spirit. And he says, listen, the, what matters the most is that you are, it's not whether or not you are circumcised. It's not matters of the flesh. It's not how you dress or how you look or how you walk or how you talk or the language. It's not about those things. It's not those things that define. He goes, here's what defines you. Have you been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Because if you have, you are a new creation. You are the new people of God. Brings me to this question. What do we do 
Why do we do? Excuse me. Got my English mixed up there. It happens with us people from Arkansas sometimes. <laughs> By the way, Cass's husband is a fellow Razorback fan and from Arkansas. Big suey. Anyway, um, <laughs> so he understands. I just, he, you know, him and Jacob, they, they, get, they get my heart here, you know. Um, we mess up. So anyway, why do you do what you do? And you think, Cody, that's a pretty broad question, you know. I brush my teeth because you got stanky breath, you know. That ain't what we're talking about. Why do you do what you do at church? Why do you do what you do in your family? Why do you do what you do at work? What is your motivation? What is your driving force? Because Paul says, listen, and again, he had so many things he could brag about. But yet, he says, well, I've set this aside and now I boast in one thing. And that is that the cross of Jesus Christ has transformed me. And so I beg to this. What should motivate us is to honor Christ and to make his name famous in all the earth. What should drive us forward in our daily, whether we're getting up and we're going to the golf course or whether we're going into the office or whether we're going to our kids' softball game or we're going to their swim meet or their football game or whatever they're doing that day or you're going to cheer the Huskers and we're going to cheer the Hogs. It don't matter. I'll cheer the Huskers too. Go Big Red. There you go. Happy birthday. <laughs> My point is this. Is everything you're doing the motivation behind it is it to honor God and make his name famous. Are you honoring God with the way you treat your family? Let me make this a little bit more. I'm going I'm to point this at me for a minute. Sometimes I struggle. My, I, my son is going through a, he's learning the, how to whine. Which is awesome. <laughs> and so I have to catch myself sometimes because I lose my motivation. I mean, it, it, you know, there's a quote out there, and I, I don't, I forget who it's from, but it says if I teach my son to throw a ball or get a high GPA and a high paying job, but I don't lead him to Christ, then I failed as a parent. How do you treat your parents? How do you treat your siblings? How do you treat your cousins? How do you treat your friends? How do you treat, oh, this one's going to hurt a little bit, brace. How do you treat your enemies? <laughs> Oof. <laughs> a little stomach punch there. Because <laughs> some of y'all, hey, I love my family. I love my friends. Cody, what would you say? Love your enemy? No, I didn't say that. Jesus did. Because ultimately the motivation should not be that I have a distant relationship with them. It should be that they have a relationship with Jesus. So we make his name famous. <laughs> we can know who we are. Y'all have heard this. Andrew says it all the time. We know who we are because of whose we are. Verse 17. From now on, comma, a comma, it took me a long time. You know, my, my college professors, they joked with me. They said, when you got married, somehow your papers got a lot better. <laughs> now, I wrote my own paper. My content is great, but my grammar is terrible. I don't know, I mean, I put a comma and, and Nikki would get mad because there'd be like capitalized words in the middle of the sentence that wasn't real. Anyway, it was just bad. But I have learned that a comma is a stopping point. And so the comma here, it says, from now on, stop, from now on. This is the point of transformation. From now on, from this point forward. You can't control what you did even before this service. You can't control how you treated your kids when they were acting a fool on the way to church this morning. 
Those who are laughing, I feel for you. Your kids wanted a donut, you didn't give it to them. They threw a fit. It happens. From now on, from this point forward, what is your motivation? What are you doing? And so from this point forward, don't let. Let is a choice. Did you see that? When somebody lets me do something, I have a choice in the matter. Paul says, don't let anyone trouble me with these things. For I bear on my body the scars which show I belong to Jesus. So the word scar here is where we get our word stigma from. The word scar. In fact, three of every five Gentiles would have been marked or branded as a slave. Paul is saying, listen, the scars. By the way, Paul had so many different things. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. He was um, beat with rods. He was, you know, all these different things. He was... He was stoned so bad that they drug him out of the city because they thought he was dead. And he got up and walked right back in that joker and started preaching again. Paul had some scars. And Paul says, listen, these scars, these bruises, these wounds, these whatever, these scars, they show who I represent. Some of you have went through some things in life. But you know what's beauty? The beauty of when God brings us through something. It's not, you know what, I went through, and y'all know my testimony. I made it through an, an addictive behavior. I made it through an addiction. And that's not for my glory. But you know what? I found that over, my, over the 12 years I've been preaching, that God has used that to lead other people out. And that's not for my glory, but that's for his glory. Are you motivated by bringing fame to his name? And so it's not just a necklace or a tattoo or a fish on the back of your car. The cross is a representative of death. It is, a, it is, a, it is our heritage that we take from the cross. We put ourselves to death. We t- take on all these hardships. Jesus looks and he says, you will go through many trials and tribulations in my name. If the world hated me, the world will also hate you. And so, bear these scars. Bear the name of Christ boldly. If somebody persecutes you, consider it a joy. That's written in the scripture. Consider it a joy. Because that leads to endurance and endurance. It shows a life that screams Jesus. Question. What does the way you carry yourself demonstrate about who or what you belong to? If we were to put your actions up on the screen... Would people tell that you are a servant of Christ? Now, we're not talking about working for your salvation because your works don't create salvation. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Works don't create it, but works do demonstrate it. Works demonstrate the work that Christ has done. The writer of Hebrews would go on to say, That you should move from milk to meat. I don't know about you, but if all I could drink was milk still, I would be frustrated because I love a steak. Anybody? Mmm, potatoes. Right? I am so glad that I get more than just milk. But then why in the world spiritually do we still accept milk when we should be feasting on meat? Paul is saying, grow. Don't accept where you are. Find a way to grow. Get in the word of God. Get deeper in God. Let him move in you. Live in the spirit. Let it change you from the inside out. And what do the things that you're doing right now, do they demonstrate a love for Jesus or do they demonstrate a love of the world? 
At the end, Paul writes in verse 18 in his benediction, he writes a pretty, I mean, this is basically like, you know, we would normally write, you know, however you end your letters, this is how Paul would normally end your letters, in his letters. In fact, it's one of the ways we know what Paul wrote and what Paul didn't write. And so he writes this, Dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in the spirit. Amen. In this benediction here, Paul says two things. And he focuses on another. He says, I am for you and I am with you. I am for you and I am with you. Paul's not writing this to people we don't care about. I'm not preaching this morning to you, people I don't care about. I'm preaching it because I love you. I'm preaching it to myself because I want to grow deeper in Jesus. I want to see our church flourish in the gospel. And to do that, we have to listen to these words. He says, I'm for you. I'm with you. I'm going through it. You're going through it. Together we can conquer it. Through the power of Jesus. Paul also focuses on grace and grace alone. This morning, we're going to have a time just to, whether you worship right where you are or you need to respond or, you know, whatever you need to do. I want to ask a couple questions just for you to think through. And you can respond as you need to. Have you experienced the full grace of Jesus in your life? Have you given your heart to Jesus? This was the hardest thing for me to realize. Because for so long I walked through my teenage years thinking I had given my life to Jesus. I took on his name. I didn't surrender. I didn't say, Jesus, I'm here. I just said, Jesus, I I hope I don't go to hell. When I was 19 years old, I said, Jesus, I surrender to you and I will do whatever you want me to do. Accepting Jesus is not a moment of surrender. It's surrendering every moment. My question this morning, there are people in this room who do not know Jesus. And this morning, we want to help you have a relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to ask everybody just to bow their head and close their eyes. And I just want to ask, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to have you stand up. I'm not going to do anything weird, I promise. Outside some of the weird stuff I said in my sermon. Is there anybody here that would just say, Cody... This morning, I want to receive the full grace of Jesus. I want him as my Savior. Would you hold your hand up? Anybody else? That's awesome. I see you. Anybody else? I see you. Anybody else? I see you. There's hands up all over the room. Everybody, you can put your hands down. My next question, are you fully surrendered? Those of us who have been living as believers, I find there are times where we give in to weakness or we give in to where we try to pull back and we try to take our hand and put it back on the wheel and take the control away from God and what Jesus is trying to do. This morning, are you fully surrendered? If you would just say, Cody, I need to surrender something this morning. I've got a sin or I've got an issue. I've got a conflict. I've got something in my life that I just need to surrender over to the cross of Jesus. Would you raise your hand up this morning? Hands are up all over the room. That's awesome. You're doing this as an act of worship. God has seen you. God knows your heart. We're going to go into a time of uh, of worship. If you, please understand this. Everybody look up at me. Everybody look up at me. 
I want you to understand this is our heart as a church. We want to help you. Those who said, hey, I need Jesus. We want to help you in that. It's not some prayer that you, you, some magic words that you have to say by saying, man, I need Jesus. You, you said, Jesus, I need you. And that, he, he changed you in that moment. But the Christian walk is not an easy one. And you should never have to do that alone. And so what we're asking is in your, in your uh, seat, you'll see some cards. And there's a decision card in there. And if you made a decision this morning to say, hey, I, man, I, I made Jesus my Savior this morning. We would love to have that because what that's going to do, that's going to go to one of our pastors. And then we're going to follow up and say, hey, listen, we want to talk with you about next steps. We want to help you grow in your faith. We want to, pl- we want to help you get plugged into the gospel. God is so good. Amen, church? I, I pray that this morning, whether it's at this stage or in your chair, that you would make it an altar and you would just spend time in prayer with the Father. As we end called to commit, right now, would you just commit yourself and say, God, wherever I'm struggling, I give it back. Or maybe it's your first time following Jesus and you say, God, I commit my life to you. I don't even know what that fully means yet, but I give it to you and God, I'll learn. But please hear me. Don't take this journey alone. Look, Satan will do anything he can to take that away. To take away, not the salvation, but the idea, the comfort in fellow believers. And so please let us know. Let me know. I'll be out in the hall. Pastor Mark will be out in the hall. Let one of us know. Let an usher know. Let somebody know. We've got elders that will be all over the building. Pastors. Let's pray and let's worship. Church, let's celebrate this morning. We've had five or more people raise their hand for salvation this morning. There's life change. Come on, let's go. Father, Lord, we praise you in this house of worship. Father, Lord, we praise you for the good works that you do. God, we haven't forgot what you do. God, we beg that you remind us when we try to take the wheel back. Lord, that we surrender over to your control. That as Paul says, my interests have been crucified in the cross of Jesus. Lord, I pray this worship is joyful and pleasing to your ears. It's in your son's name. Amen.